paper. So we're going to just graph a bunch of popular functions using the clueless method. So we're going to be cluelessly graphing some common functions. And we'll start with the we'll start with the square root function and then the cube root function. Actually, let's go even easier than that. Let's start with f of x equals x. So before we even graph, uh, we don't actually need to graph this in a clueless method. What kind of graph will this function have? It's too easy, you don't want to say. It's going to be a line. What kind of line? Oh, it's going to be through the origin. It's through the origin. Y intercept is 0. What's the slope? 1. 1. So let's go ahead and graph this very, very quickly. It was so easy, it was difficult. If I put a point on here, I think 1, 0, 0, and 1, 1, you can, of course, label any points. But I think those would probably be the easiest points to label right there. So that's the f of x equals x function. We did not graph that cluelessly because we knew it was a line. And we'll just bump up the power of x. So we'll graph the x squared function. Now most of you have seen this graph before. It's going to be the parabola. But let's pretend you didn't. And we're going to go with the clueless method. So we're going to pick some x values, figure out the y values. So we're making a table. And we're just going to go from negative 2 to positive 2 to square all those values for the right side. We get 4. 1, 0, 1, 4, and graphing this, 0, 0, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and way up at 4, The main points I want you to look at are not the ones up at 4, but the three points at the bottom, right down there. <coughs> so there's our parabola. Now we're going to go for the x cubed function. So we graph the x cubed function, we're going to do the same thing. Build a table of values and go ahead and cube all those and write down their cubed values. Am I going too fast? I think most of this is review, so I'm trying to get through it quick. <coughs> so minus two cubed is minus eight, minus one cubed is minus one, zero cubed zero, one cubed is eight. Uh, 1 cubed is 1, 2 cubed is 8. So we are going to have y values way up at 8 and negative 8. And I'm not going to worry about exactly where those are. So I'm just going to plot the three points close to the origin. And I'm going to estimate where the two points that have the 8 and negative 8 y values would be. So they'd be somewhere right about there. I don't want to count super precise all the way up to 8, but I'm just going to estimate where they would be. And now we want to connect this with the curve. <clears throat> Try to make it smooth so this would not be a smooth curve, although it would connect all of the five points together. So try to give your curve, like you're building a road. You don't want people to have to turn too sharply, but you do need to cross through all five points. So that's about the best we can do right there. So those are the polynomial functions we're going to look at now. 
There is a degree four, but we're not going to look at that degree four. And we're going to look at the uh, we'll look at the reciprocal function first, the one over x function. Now I did not consider the domain on any of the previous graphs. If I wrote down the domain, what, what's the domain of all three functions that we graphed so far? All the inputs. Describe the inputs or the x values. Are there any restrictions? So that's the domain, all real numbers. So I didn't write them down, but all three of these have the domain negative infinity, positive infinity. Because again, we had no square roots, no division at all. So there's no uh, operations I had to be careful about. Now we're going to look at some functions that don't have a full domain. So what's the x value I'm not allowed to use here? Zero. So don't use zero. Don't divide by zero. So we'll do the same thing, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. But where I have 0, I'm going to cross that row out. So we're not going to have a point at 0. So now plug in, get the y values. So reciprocal of negative 2, negative 1 half. Reciprocal of negative 1 is negative 1. Reciprocal of 1 is 1. Reciprocal of 2, 1 half. And now we're ready to graph these four points. So we got 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. And now the other points, I drew this a little bit bigger so I can squeeze in the halves. So there's 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2. So any questions on those four points? So let's keep going <coughs> to the right. And I want you to think about what happens when x is getting bigger. So if I put 3 in our chart, I would get 1 third. If I put in 4, I'd get a fourth. Let's jump way down to 10, and I would get 1 tenth. So what happens when x is getting bigger? Drop in 100, I get 1 hundredth. So describe this phenomenon of what's happening when x is getting very big. What is happening to the y values? They're getting really small. So they're going to be getting close to 0, but they're all going to be positive numbers. So the way we draw that on the graph, I could put in 3 and a third, something like this. I could go 4 and a fourth. But as you can tell, it's going to get very close to the x-axis. So at some point, it's going to be kind of silly to keep drawing in dots. So what we do is we draw what's called a horizontal asymptote, which is a vertical line, y equals 0. You draw it like a dotted line. And you draw your curve. Your curve is supposed to get close to this dotted line. So we're going to approach the line y equals 0. So y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. And now let's think about when x goes from, one to, from 2 back to 1. We're going to get a curve between these two points. And what happens <coughs> when we move to the left of 1 as we approach 0? So I don't see the x value in this chart. But if I try it out 1 half, I would get the reciprocal, which is 2. If I tried something really small like 1 tenth, I would get out the reciprocal, which is 10. So when x is getting very small, the y value is getting very big. 
So we're going to be approaching up there. And because we're approaching the axis, we're going to label this vertical asymptote as x equals 0. And this is a vertical asymptote. A lot of people like to use highlighters. If you have a highlighter or a colored pencil, it's a good time to use it. So there's our vertical asymptote. My highlighter only writes one direction nicely. Oh, there we go. There's my y equals 0 horizontal asymptote also. What kind of symmetry does it look like our graph has just off these four points that we plotted? Origin. Origin. We could test this function very easily without looking at a graph. Plug in negative x, and we would definitely get origin symmetry out of here. You would get negative f of x. So our function is odd. We, all we need to do is just rotate this graph halfway around the origin and regraph the same curve. So it's going to look like this. So there's our two curves. You don't need to label your asymptotes on both sides. What I mean, it's a little bit redundant because I have my horizontal label over here. I don't also need to label it over here. And likewise, the vertical asymptote, I already had a label at the top. I don't then also need a label at the bottom as well. You just need to label a line in one spot. So there's the 1 over x graph. And we'll do the uh, root functions next. So we'll start with square root x. So domain is definitely not going to be all real numbers. What's the domain of this function? Is zero okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where can I go? Positive numbers or negative numbers from zero? I can go all the positive numbers and zero. So we go zero to infinity. I think I talked about the domain of the previous problem and never wrote it down. So I'm going to write the previous domain down. <coughs> so that domain was everything but zero. So negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. You can see it right on the chart when I crossed out zero, but we should write it down. So there's our domain. So our table of values for the square root, we're going to start at 0. We don't need any negative numbers. And let's go all the way to 4. So we're going to go from 0 to 4. So go ahead and fill in the y values. So even though we went from 0 to 4, there's really only three nice y values in there. We're going to skip 2 and 3 because the values, the y values are kind of ugly. So we're only going to plot the three points that have nice y coordinates. So we have 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. And connect these together with a smooth curve. <clears throat> Why does my curve not keep going down here? How do I know my curve does not go to the left of zero? So our domain cuts it off. So domain says don't go past zero. So all that. Anything to the left would not be correct. How do I know that there's nothing down here? I could have a square root of negative, but what would this be a function? No. Nope. So that curve has basically already reserved all the x values right here. 
so I can't have another y value appearing down below. So there's our square root. Now we're gonna go with cube root. So we could see it written as the third root of x, or you might see it as x to the one-third power. Could appear either way. Is there anything to worry about on the domain with this cube root function? No, all the odd roots you don't have to worry, just the even ones. So this domain's all real numbers. So we definitely want zero in on the uh, table of values. And let's go, we'll go negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. I'm gonna leave a little bit of space above negative two. So now cube root of all these, this will be cube root of negative two. With odd roots, you're allowed to bring your negative outside. So odd roots are odd functions, so you can bring your negative through the function, like you can with any odd function. Third root of negative one, that's just negative one. Third root of zero is zero. Third root of positive one is one. And third root of two doesn't get any better. What is the next positive integer that has a nice cube root? It's not four. Four's got a nice square root. So eight is the next value that has a nice cube root, and the cube root of eight is two. And likewise, negative eight. Negative eight is negative two times negative two times negative two, so the cube root of eight is negative two. So now we're gonna graph these out. We're gonna graph at one, x values of one, and then go way out to eight. Negative one, and way over to negative eight. So we have zero, zero, one, one, negative one, negative one, and now eight, two, and negative eight, negative two. So do your best to connect these together. This will look a lot like the cube graph that we did. It's actually the inverse function, or the opposite function. So everything we've done here, this is all the clueless method. So it should be a review of how you've been graphing. So you should be slightly bored. Most of you appear to be so. So any questions before we start to get into potential new things? <clears throat> so we're going to do one piecewise function and answer some questions about that. And then we're going to get into transformations. These are also called step functions. And they have different pieces defined for different x values or different parts of the domain. So it's basically a couple of functions glued together. So we're gonna go ahead and graph this particular function. You write them out, they're gonna be, this one will have three pieces, so we we'll use a big squiggle brackets. You can just draw a vertical squiggly line. So the first piece, 
is negative 2x plus 1, and this is if x is between negative 3 and 1. And second piece is if x equals 1. And then the third piece is if x is greater than 1. So piece 1, we have f of x equals negative 2x plus 1. What type of a function is this? How we describe the graph? Linear function, slope? Uh, negative two. So slope, negative 2. And what about the y-intercepts? It'll be 0, 1. OK. Now when we graph this, you don't want to just graph the entire line. You want to be careful. There is very limited x values here. So we're only going from negative 3 to 1. Do I include the endpoints on the interval? So which endpoint should I include in this interval? Negative three. So we do want negative 3. We don't want to include 1. So we have this close at negative 3, open at 1. Is the y-intercept included in our interval? What coordinate should I look at in the y-intercept, the 0 or the 1? The zero, so a zero inside our x-interval. Yes. So this y-intercept is included in our graph. So start off graphing this function. I'm going to use way more x-values than I really need on my graph, because I'm going to put all the graphs on the same, uh, the same plane here. So I'm going from minus 3 to positive 1. My y-intercept is 0, 1. So there's the y-intercept. <clears throat> I could plug in values to plot them, or I could just use the slope as negative 2 and then graph the function that way. So I'm just going to use slope negative 2 and then sketch this line. So negative 2 means go over 1, down 2. So we're going to get this point. Now when I go over 1 the other way, I'm going to go up 2. I'm going to Need some more y values here. So there's my other points. And now I have to decide which uh, endpoints is missing. I go from negative 3 to 1, but I skip 1. So right around 1 is going to be my empty dot. All these others are filled in. And then connect these together with a line. Hopefully your line is less bendy than mine. So any, any questions on this first piece that we graphed? So the, this line does not go on forever at both ends, so you don't put arrows on it. So this just goes right where I drew it. All right, piece two, we're going to graph that next. This is row two. It's a little bit strange. The function is just two. I could write this as 0x plus 2. That's definitely equal to 2. So what type of graph would this function have? What kind of line are we looking at with the slope of 0? That will be horizontal. So we've got a horizontal line with a uh, y-coordinate always 2. So if I graphed it, it would be graphed out like that, horizontal line, y is always 2. That's what the graph would look like. <clears throat> However, I have to be very careful about the x values. So what x values are we using? One. Only 1. So when x is 1, our y value will be 2. So when x is 1, I don't get the full line right here. I don't get that. All I get is one point on that line. 
So the only point I get is this point right up there at 2. It's a very small piece. It's as small of a piece as you can have and still call it a piece of the function. All right, last up, piece three. Well, we just graphed this function. This is the parabola. And <clears throat> I want to graph it out when x is greater than 1. So I'm going to fill in with green the entire graph. So don't copy down what I'm doing in green. This is the entire graph of the function. I want you to figure out what part of that graph should actually be included. So we want from 1 and or greater than 1. So it immediately throws away everything on the left side. So drawing the correct piece. So I drew in way too much right there. I don't want anything to the left of 1, so that means everything down here in the lower left is gone. So I should only have that piece right there. And if I was going for super accuracy, this piece would be, that point would be 2, 4. So this is a weird looking function. Does it pass the vertical line test? Is it a function? gets a little sketchy right around 1. However, no matter where you look around 1, if you look to the left of 1, you're going to be on this curve. If you look to the right of 1, you're exactly on that curve. And if you're equal to 1, you're right there. So no matter what your x value is, you're going to appear one place. So there's our piecewise function. And now we're going to answer some questions. So looking just at this graph now, find f of negative 2, f of 1, f of 2, and then solve the equation f of x equals 4. So first up, f of negative 2 is 5. We get that because we're on piece number 1. f of positive 1, that's that single point we just talked about. That's y coordinate of 2. And f of positive 2, that's that point 2 comma 4. So our y coordinate is 4. So any questions on getting the three y values right there? Now we're going to look for the solution to f of x equals 4. So before we actually look at the graph, is 4 an x value or a y value? So 4 is a y value. So anytime I give you a y value of a function, there could be more than one x value that gets to that y value. So if you're answering this question in algebraic form, don't just stop if you find one solution with one of these three pieces. If I use the graph, I have to think about y value of 4, and basically where does this horizontal line intersect the graph. So there are two places. One of them is already labeled. So one of them is, if you take 2 and f it, you get 4. So one answer is x equals 2. What piece is the other solution on? Piece 1, 2, or 3? piece 1, and it looks like it should be somewhere right about there. So if your graph is accurate, you could tell right off the graph. But let's say that it, the graph isn't accurate, or maybe 
uh, it wouldn't be a nice value. So I see there's one solution on piece one. So what I'm going to do is write the equation for piece one right at the top of the screen. f of x equals negative 2x plus 1. And I want to know when does that equal 4. So I'm setting this equal to 4. I want to know what x value gives me 4. Subtract 1. Divide by negative 2. And our second x value is negative 3 halves. And our first one was 2. So negative 3 halves would be the x value right below that point. Right there. Certainly the graph gave us an estimate. If we're just halfway between one and negative one and negative two. So that's the end of basic graphs. Now we're going to look at uh, transformations. So we do transformations on graphs. I'm going to switch back to uh, graph paper. We're going to start with the easier ones first. So we'll do the vertical shift. Now we do the vertical shift. We're going to begin with g of x equals f of x plus k. So whenever you see this, this means the graph of g. It is the graph of f. Shifted up units. And when we're feeling lazy, we just draw an up arrow with the K. So that's the way, instead of writing out shift the graph up K units, you just do up arrow with the K. All right, so ready for our first example with this. So we have to write down what is the base function, and what's the graph of that look like, and then what is the transformation. So on these easy uh, beginning examples, all you do is cover up the transformation. So your base function is x squared. So our base function is going to be x squared. So here is where you need to remember the graph. So going back to that previous page, you have to remember the x squared graph. There's really three points that I wanted you to remember. And then it is a parabola. So again, we're not graphing with the clueless method anymore. We know what the original graph looks like. So you could tell me this goes up how many units? negative 4, or you can more reasonably say down 4. So you can either tell me it goes up negative 4, or you could say down 4. If you are good at visually uh, thinking about things, you can just take these four points and just move them down. But let's say you're much better with numbers than you are with pictures. What's really happening with these points right here? What's happening to their coordinates when you move them down? So this point's 1, 1 on the right side. 
what's going to happen at that point when we move it down four? Obviously, it's going to go down four, but what's going to change? So what's going to happen to the y? Down four. We're going to decrease by four. So you could write down all the coordinates and just think, take the y coordinates down by four. So subtract four and then replot those points. So when we apply our transformation, there's our new zero, zero points going to be down there at negative four, or zero, negative four. The other two points are going to end up still up one and over one, and they're going to be one, negative three. And the other point is going to be negative one, negative three. And now connect all these together, same curve. So there is our graph right there. It's kind of messy. So I'm not going to write up negative 4. I'm just going to leave it at down 4. I think that's way better way to describe this graph. So we graph our base function and then graph our transformation function. So that's vertical shift. We're going to do horizontal shift next. So I should label this. This is a vertical shift. And now we're going to look at horizontal shift. Now, one thing to remember about horizontal, all these affect the input or the x-coordinate. So they're all going to uh, be operations on the x-coordinate. So the big difference is this does have a plus or a minus, but in this horizontal, it's going to be subtracted or added to the h, or to the x, not to the function itself. So this is different from the first one, not because of the letter h versus k, but because the k was added outside the function. That's the main difference here. So this h is added to the x inside the function. And the graph of g is the graph of f shifted to the right h. And of course, we just use the right arrow with an H. So that's how we're going to write this. So one thing I want you to notice, when we shift to the right, it looks negative. So when we have a shift in the positive direction, it shows up like it's negative. And if we actually want to shift the graph in the negative direction, we're going to add to it instead of subtract. So when we graph these, I want to state the base function, the original function. State the base function and the transformations. So there's two transformations happening in this function. 
So I see the minus 4. Does that minus 4 that I circle, does that horizontal or vertical? Vertical. How do you know it's vertical? Outside. Outside, so it's not next to the x. And plus 3, it's horizontal. Well, because it's not vertical, but because it's next to the x. Is that going to go left or right 3? It's going to go left 3. So it looks like it should be shifting us the positive direction, but all the horizontals go the opposite way they appear. So it's going to shift us left. We're always going to do horizontals first. I'll write down the ordering again. So horizontally, we're going left 3. Vertically, we're going down 4. So we're going to left 3, down 4. Same base function as before. So we've got our x squared function, graph that out quickly, three points. So there's our base function. When we apply transformations, we're going to go one at a time. So don't you can apply two at the same time, but you want to be careful. If they're the wrong two, you, you will mess it up. Uh, <coughs> you can always do horizontal and vertical at the same time, but I'm going to show you a very specific way we're going to do stretching after we do shifting, and the order matters very much when we just introduce stretching. So we're going to intentionally go horizontal first, and then vertical second. So our first graph, when we do shift left 3, the function we're actually be graphing is this one, y equals x plus 3 squared. So forget about the minus 4, we're just going to go left 3. So graph this function right now. Take all your x coordinates, negative 1, 0, 1, and shift them left 3. And then regraph this. So any questions on the shift left? And now shift down. So last step, we're gonna go down four, write out the full function now. This is the x plus three squared minus four. So we are no longer going to be graphing cluelessly. We know what the base functions look like, and we're just applying transformations now. And that's our final graph right there. So next up, we're going to do horizontal. Oh, there's one function I forgot. We got just enough time to put that in. One function I forgot, that's the absolute value function. So absolute value, we're going to go 0, 1, 2, and negative 1, negative 2. Absolute value of these, and really quickly put the graph up. Now you want to be careful, if these are the only three points you graph, I could draw the parabola out of this. This is not the parabola. This is actually two half lines or two rays that look like this. So this is the absolute value function. And it has full domain. <coughs> 